Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today on Veterans Day. Yep, today is Veterans Day, and we are having a devotion. And I want to just say thank you for all those who have risked their lives to keep this country free from tyranny, from its own government, and from outside forces. And continue to pray that men and women will check their hearts and see that they need to defend the Constitution of this country as they serve the people of this country. And so I, for one, truly appreciate all those who risk their lives uh, to keep us free. And if you're in an opportunity where you see a serviceman, I know I see them periodically when I'm traveling overseas or in between uh, our own country and I, I try to take the time and say thank you so much for your service or if I'm out in the restaurant and I see someone who's usually wearing a veteran's shirt or a hat you know I thank them for their service because without that service uh, we would probably not be where we are today so I thank them today and thank you for joining us today I know that there won't be too many uh, so We'll just go ahead and get through this. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And if you're in the neighborhood, you're more than welcome to join us at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. Today we are in the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. So if you want to turn there, let's pray. Gracious Father, we just come before you, Lord, asking for the filling of the Holy Spirit and, Father, for the coming upon the the Holy Spirit, Lord, that he would come upon us and anoint us and fill us, Father, to live boldly in this world today, our Christian faith, Lord. May you minister to us as the writer continues to share with us about our Savior Jesus Christ and how much better the second covenant uh, is compared to the first that is uh, vanishing away, but yet we still have great principles uh, to draw from the Old Testament, Lord. And so minister to us as we look at chapter 10. There's a couple of good spots here that we use, uh, Father, as proof texts to going to church and also to pray to our Father who has uh, much grace for us, Lord. And so we pray this morning that you just minister to us as we're getting up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Patty. Glad you're watching. We are in Hebrews chapter 10. Let's go ahead and read. It is a long chapter, about 39 verses. So let's go ahead and get through this. And I'm going to stop at a couple of points. For the law, he starts, for the law, that is the Old Testament Ten Commandments of God and the 400 and something that the Jews came up with, having a shadow of good things to come. A shadow, that is, it, it, it shadowed of things that were coming in the future. We talked about this last time we met. Uh, the good things to come was the death of our Savior Jesus Christ, and not the very image of the thing can never, with these same sacrifices which they offered continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. So he's talking about the Levitical system, the offering up of sacrifices. It is not what makes a person perfect. Uh, works do not make us perfect, guys. Understand that from the Old Testament, and I think we do. Most Christians understand. No, the works do not save us, and the works do not make us perfect. Neither do our works today make us perfect. Right? <clears throat> Galatians is very clear. Who has bewitched you? Who has made you turn back to the laws, thinking that you can, you can build upon your salvation by your works? That's... Uh, something that the church struggles with. A lot of individuals struggle with it. They're still under that Levitical law. They think that by their works, they're actually um, getting better, being more righteous, and so forth. But they're not. Uh, they're not at all. We are, we are as righteous as we can ever be because of the blood of Jesus Christ. How much more righteous can, are we supposed to be? Right? The blood of Jesus Christ was enough. It's his imputed righteousness upon us. If the limit of cash was a million dollars, how much more than a million dollars can you have? Nothing. It's a limit. Uh, you're at that limit. And so our righteousness is at that limit because of Jesus Christ alone. And we can't build upon that. And if you think that you're building upon your righteousness by doing the deeds that you're doing, and that you might think, oh, it makes me feel better. I'm better than other people and blah, blah, blah. You're wrong. 
You're no better than anyone else. We're all sinners. Paul said in 1 Timothy 1.15, this is a faithful saying that Christ came to die for sinners, of whom I am the chief of sinners. That would change my perspective, right? On a lot of things, if I really believed that I was a sinner. <clears throat> so, it just was a shadow of things to come. For then, would they not have ceased to be offered for the worshiper once purified would have had no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin every year. Can you imagine? Uh, every year when you offered the sacrifice, you were reminded, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. Uh, every time you offered up sacrifice, it reminds you, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. And that's what they did. It reminded you of your sinfulness. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. So that's an impossibility. It just doesn't work that way. Therefore, when he, that is Jesus, came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offering and sacrifices for sin, you have no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O oh God. And so what was really needed was ultimately for God in the flesh to come and die for the sins of the world. God has no pleasure in your sacrifices and offerings. They don't do anything for him. God doesn't require those things. All he requires is our faith in Jesus Christ. We are saved by grace through faith. And it's not of ourselves least we should boast. It's not of works. Otherwise, we can boast about it. And so, something greater. Jesus is the living word. Jesus is the word of God. In other words, uh, everything that the word says, Jesus is that characteristic of the word. Uh, not that he's actually the word, and it's all written on him. No, everything that the word has said to us in principles and statutes and commandments and laws and how we ought to live and stuff is all in Jesus's heart. It all stems from that. So he oozes out the word of God. Verse eight, previously saying sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire nor had pleasure in them, which, were, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. He takes away what first? The law. That he may establish the second, which is the grace of God. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Now, what, the, what does the word sanctified means? It's mean, it means basically being set apart for God. So we are all being set apart for God's glory. We're being sanctified. That means that we're not perfect. We're not there yet. None of us are there yet. None of us have achieved. And none of us will probably ever achieve. We can grow from glory to glory, as Paul said. But we have not achieved completely until we get to heaven. But we are sanctified. And so we are to live as though we're set apart for God. So we make the choices to live a set apart life from the world unto the Lord. That... And in, in, in every priest stands, ministering daily, verse 11, and offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never take away sin. But this man, that is Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And from that time waiting till his enemies are made a footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Amen to that, right? Yes. He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Who has perfected? Jesus has perfected us, right? It's his work through the Holy Spirit. Look at this, verse 15. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he has said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Then he added, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Let's back up just one. Good morning. Take hold of that guy. Verse 16 again. I, I just want to make a reference to this real quickly because I think this is important um, for us to understand. Um, 
we have the word of God that is written on books and papers so that we can read it. But ultimately, God has written his law in our hearts. There is a conscience within each man and person that knows what is right from wrong, consciously, with conscience. That's what the word conscience means. It means with understanding. So when we do things, we know with understanding what it is that we're doing. I think it's natural for us to realize that when you steal, it's wrong. And that's with conscience. You're stealing with knowing that this is wrong. And God has written that law in our hearts so that we can know. This is why the law did not exist until after Moses went to Mount Sinai. Before that, the law was in man's hearts. God told them what the law was. God expressed to them what was right and wrong, and they knew in their hearts what was right and wrong, and they were to live according to their hearts. And in these last days, the same thing is true. Gentiles know. I remember, you know, as being, as being a Gentile, uh, I did have some religious background, but I didn't um, pursue that religious system as much as my parents probably pursued it when they were older. But I had enough of God's word in me that I knew that when I did things, they were just wrong. And I was convicted by them at the times, but I ignored it. I ignored it. And I didn't follow through in being obedient to the law. So when he says he adds their sins and their lawless deeds, I remember them no more. Um, though they sin, he says, because of the sacrifice of the son, he will remember the sins no more. Isn't that amazing? I think that's an amazing thing that God says, Totalistai, it is finished, it is complete. As far as the east is from the west, I remember your sins no more. God does not look at our sins. They're forgiven. Past, present, and future. We forget that, don't we? It's, it's hard to live that way. Uh, the enemy won't let us live that way. People won't let us live that way. It's hard to live in a way where you realize that when I sin, it's forgiven already. Even before I ask God to forgive me, it's already forgiven because the death of Jesus Christ on the cross has forgiven us of those sins, future sins. But we ask for forgiveness. Why? For our own heart's sake, so that we can humble ourselves before the Lord and ask for help so that we don't continue to sin that way. And so when we, <laughs> when we see others sinning or we think they're sinning, uh, it's forgiven. That's a hard perspective to the grasp because we start judging others and what they're doing. And we put ourselves in a place of judgment and not in a place of grace. And so all our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. He remembers them no more, he says. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So after all of these things, he kind of summarizes it and says, look, let us hold that faith fast. Let's hold on to it and let us encourage one another, not tear each other down, but encourage one another. Gather together in the church of God. That is the church in a building where they gather together with the structure that God has established, Acts chapter 15, the Moses model, uh, with pastors and assistants and elders and deacons and the church functioning the way God has established it to function and exhorting one another in love, especially as we see the day approaching. That is a good biblical perspective on what the church is supposed to be doing. Very, very clear to us. Unfortunately, the church has hurt itself. I would venture to say the mega churches have hurt the church. Now, I'm not being judgmental. I'm just re sharing with you the facts. Um, <clears throat> I read an article <clears throat> again about, uh, and I've been sharing this because it impacted me greatly. <clears throat> I can remember back in the 
1990s and 2000s how how some of these atheists were actually making videos and posting stuff and about the Christian church and how we need to get rid of the Christian church and religion and all of this because it's holding our society back. Uh, <clears throat> we're, we're not experiencing the things that that we should experience in science and culture and arts and all these things because it's the church keeping us from experiencing that because they're not so open-minded. Well, now here we are in, in, in 2019, and an article was written by some, and what is actually happening today, because they have been successful to a certain degree. The church is getting smaller. Uh, God is weeding out those that are really not his, the, the goats and the terrors who are walking away from the Lord and the, and the church. Uh, and because they're getting smaller and smaller and people no longer believe in morality, we're seeing the repercussions in our culture today. And so we are seeing what's happening with same-sex marriage. We're seeing what's happening in the school system and abortions increasing and, and this education, not just in, in teaching biology, but teaching them how to have sexual relationships and be safe with it so, if, so that they don't get pregnant. But if they get pregnant, then they can always go to an abortion clinic and get a, an abortion without their parents even knowing. And how the identity of humanity is is lost now. We don't even know what a man is or what a woman is. And, and they're realizing that our culture is getting worse and not better. Now that religion is out of school, now that religion is less, now that faith is less, and our culture is getting worse. Because now we don't know what a man is and what a woman is. And you have educated people uh, coming up with ways to not offend others by, by having forms that, that, that have Remarks even on the census, you'll probably see this coming year on the census male female and then other what you prefer to be called I'm sure it's going to be on there and these are educated professors uh, Psychologists and so forth that are printing this stuff. They're supposed to be smart people and yet they're not so smart and they're realizing Wow Wow, our culture is getting worse because of the fact that we have removed religion from the church. There's no moral values anymore. There's no more right or wrong, and they're doing what is right in their own eyes. And that's so true. We see it true today. And it's so clear. And, and it's just going to continue to get worse. This is part of the, the world falling away from Christ. Now, one reason I think that the church is falling away from Christ is because they feel that they don't need to go to church anymore. They can stay home. I was having a conversation with someone just yesterday. And they were trying to encourage their family members to go to church. And they says, oh, I, we go to church. We watch a video of, a, of this guy on, on TV, and that's our church. How do you tithe? Oh, we tithe. We tithe. That's not church. That is not the biblical <laughs> church, guys. And unfortunately, that video watching thing has come through, through Facebook, has come through Instagram and many other social medias. But the majority of that has come through the mega churches. Because the mega churches now are no longer sending people out to start churches. No, no, no. They keep the resources to themselves by sending out off-site campuses with great video machinery to videotape that one church where that one pastor's at to that location. And people gather together to watch a video of that person. Um, there used to be a program on years ago. And they're based out of Colton. And I used to watch them periodically on, on the channel that they were on. <clears throat> and they would broadcast from that place. But I worked in that area and I never saw anybody there. It was constantly <laughs> empty. And then it turns out I ended up meeting the guy at a conference one time and I asked him about that. That's right. Oh yeah, yeah, we go there. We go there I think twice a year and we record all the messages. We record them all. And then we just play them throughout the year. And I'm like, wow, that's why it sits empty the whole time. He goes, yeah, yeah, most of the time it's just empty. So all of these things are just recorded messages, you know, that are out there and people think it's real time. Um, I'll, I'll guarantee you that, it, maybe not, hopefully not, but I'll guarantee you if one day a pastor's not even going to go to church, he's going to be in a location, nobody knows. Because if you've got 10 off-site campuses, you don't know where he is at. So he just, he's just going to stay home and record it and <laughs> just broadcast them to all 10. I'm not saying that's going to happen. And I'm not trying to be judgmental. What, I, what I'm trying to say is, instead of sending out pastors to start churches and communities that need it and have real people and real fellowship with real... I remember a story one time of a, a, a little girl, whether it was true or not, I don't know, 
but this little girl was trying to go to sleep and mommy was touching the little girl, scratching her back. And, and then finally she walked away in the bed and it was raining that day, thunder and lightning. And all of a sudden big thunder came and she just jumped up and screamed and ran into her mother's bed. And she says, what's wrong, sweetheart? What's wrong? And, and uh, she says, I'm scared. She goes, don't you know Jesus is with you? You don't have to be scared. She goes, I know mommy, Jesus is with me, but sometimes I just have to feel some skin. You know, I just have to feel some skin. And I think that's so true, is that we need to be able to see someone, be able to talk to someone, shake their hand, give them a, a, a hug if they're huggers, if they're handshakers, and shake them if they're back, back patters, then back, pat them on the back, you know, that type of thing. And I think we, the church, have, dis, have done ourselves a disfavor. And by the way, uh, these mega churches supposedly are supposed to change our culture. Hasn't changed it at all. It's getting worse. So mega churches isn't the answer. You know what the answer is? Jesus Christ. Amen. And being biblical. <clears throat> That's the answer. That every man and woman would just love Jesus and be obedient to what God has called us to do as Christian believers. So we need to be in church. If you're not in church, get in church. Find a church. Join our church. <clears throat> I believe that we're a biblical church. We love teaching through the Bible. I was really encouraged yesterday. Someone came up to me and they said, thank you so much. You just stick with the scripture. You just expound the scripture. You don't go over here. You don't give these flowery words. And I, I listen to pastors and I listen to all these flowery words and they come up with all this intellectual stuff. And, and I don't get it sometimes, but you just simply stick with the word and you give us the application to it and you move on. And, and they said, thank you so much because I learned so much more about the Bible than I do about a lot of other things. So get into church. Verse 26, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment, a fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who rejects Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much more, how much worse punishment do you suppose will be through, will he be through the worthy, thought worthy, who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted by the Spirit of grace. Wow. So what he's saying here is, look, if you break Moses' law, you're condemned and judged right there. How much more if you're saved by grace that you trample on Jesus' blood by falling back into the world? How much worse of a judgment will come on you? Now we see this in Luke chapter 8, right? Just real quickly the seeds and how it falls into certain hearts. None of them are saved except the one that produces the fruits that are evidence of the salvation. The other ones profess to know Christ, but then temptation, the devil, cares of this life, carry them away into something else. No, our salvation should be consistent and it should be continually, every single day, growing and growing more and more in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you can't see that because I see it. How many of you here see that? How many? Most of you all here see it. Maybe one or two don't see that. Let me say this. When Jesus talked to Nicodemus, he said this, unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. That word see doesn't just mean that you're going to see it and walk in. That word in the Greek means experience it. Experience the truth of it. Understand what the gospel really means. Understanding what it means to be born again, that you're a new creature in Christ Jesus, that you no longer have this old life, but a new life in Christ Jesus. But see, an unbeliever, one who professes to know Jesus, might say, I know Jesus, but he doesn't see the kingdom of God because he's really not born again. And he needs to become born again. How can you say that? How can you judge someone's heart? I can't. But I do know there's a scripture that says, Knock, knock, Jesus, let me in. And he says, I don't know you. Depart from me. You're a worker of iniquity. You have lived like your old life the whole time. You never knew me. So there is a deception upon those who proclaim to know Jesus, but really don't know Jesus. And they don't know him. And it's a scary place to be to think that you don't need to be in the church. You don't need to be in accountability to believers. It's a scary place for you. And I encourage you to become more biblical. Because uh, worse, what do he say? Worse judgment will be upon you, right? 
He goes on, for we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord again. The Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. Mm. But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle, spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became uh, companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Uh, one reason that I think Paul wrote this is, is that statement there. And joyfully accepted the plundering. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, verse 34. And you have compassion on me in my chains. Who else was in chains? Uh, we don't know of anyone else that was in chains except for the Apostle Paul who was put in chains in Rome there. So anyway, just thought I'd throw that out to you guys that like to teach, study the Bible and teach it. Let's close up. <clears throat> Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Now, after you have what? Done the will of God. That means participation, right? You can't do the will of God without participating in the kingdom of God. That means fellowship with the people. That means tithing and giving and supporting the church. That means keeping your promises. That, <laughs> there, it means so much. That means knowing to do good and you do good, and yet you don't do it. And so you need to keep those things. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Yet, uh, For yet a little while, he said, who is, who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. I love, I love that the just shall live by faith. I was praying this morning and thinking about that scripture. Um, and I thought that would make a good message uh, today. That we live by faith and not by sight. Amen. And what that means. And, and look at the two differences between the emotional uh, drive and the spiritual drive. And how they're so contradicting to one another. Now, as believers, we live by faith. Uh, that was Martin Luther's thesis when he hung it on the Catholic Church. Tried for years to get them uh, to change as a church uh, drilled in them that they were to penit, have penance. And so Martin Luther many times would crawl on his hands and knees, you know, walking upstairs to show that he is truly a saint. Uh, again, works. Uh, praying every step of the way a certain prayer and sacraments and things like this, you know, to show that he's a saint, a true saint. I'm a true saint. And yet he didn't realize that none of it was contributing to his sainthood at all. And that the just shall live by faith. By faith. You know, again, that guy knocking on the door. Lord, Lord, let us in. You know, um, he's probably one of these persons that, yeah, I proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. Um, I let people know because I do this, I do that. And I show it in front of them, what it is and all of this and that. And yet, his, he's not walking by faith faith he's walking by sight everything he does is about sight letting people see his works letting people uh, <clears throat> see how righteous she is you know and what she's done here and what she's done there and and so forth when it's not by faith that's what Martin Luther was doing a monk whipping himself in penance prayer after prayer after prayer after, I, I pray ceasingly but he realized none of it none of it was doing anything at all. It's, it's faith alone. But if anyone draws back or backslides, my soul has no pleasure in him. Wow. That's a hard one right there. When you read that, when you go, whoa. Yeah. If I take a step back, Chuck would always say, you can't walk forward if you're walking backwards. Mm. Uh, and you can add to that, God is not pleased if you're walking backwards. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, that is to hell, like Judas Iscariot who turned back, and he was a son of perdition, but of those who believed 
to the saving of the soul. So a true believer will not turn back. He will continue to go forward and seek after God. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for your precious word. It is only through your Holy Spirit, Lord, that this will be received. It has nothing to do with me, Lord. I'm just the, the reader and a bad one at that, Lord. But Lord, let it be the Holy Spirit, Father, that takes your words of truth, Father, of biblical truth, Lord, and let it touch our hearts, Lord. And right now, even now, as people are listening or will be listening later on, Lord, that are sitting or, or, or driving, Lord, and listening to this and saying, wow, I don't do that, Lord. I pray that they, they act upon that and not just acknowledge it, Lord God, and turn back to you, Lord. And I pray that in Jesus' name and through the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. May you move in your church today. In his name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. I pray that you have a blessed day on this Veterans Day. And again, thank you for all those who have risked their lives for our freedom. And your service is highly appreciated here at Calvary Chapel Inland. God bless.